for all. The Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade happened on Friday, July 24th, 2022, which happened to be the first day of the National League's convention in Teresa, you're muted. Oh, was I muted, muted the whole time? From the National Convention. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, my computer must have done that. Okay, so I'll, let me go back. So um, the Supreme Court decision of overturning Roe v. Wade happened on Friday, June 24th, on the first day of the league's National Convention in Denver. And our national president, Dr. Deborah Turner, who was one of our panelists this evening, gave an emotional response that evening to this decision. And now tonight, we're going to hear from several speakers on this issue who are going to share their expertise and provide the necessary information we need to be advocates for reproductive freedom. And now I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for this evening, Diane Bystrom. Diane served as the former director of the Carrie Chapman Cat Center for Women and Politics. And she is currently a member of the board of directors of the Nebraska League of Women Voters. And Diane, I'm turning it over now to you. Thank you, Therese. And I'm going to go ahead and share a screen here. Um, So my task tonight actually is to do a brief history. And I know that there's been a lot of talk, you know, since the Roe was uh, overturned. So a lot of talk has been on the past 50 years from Roe until when it was overturned. But really, if you look at um, reproductive rights in this country, you see that it really dates back to um, laws and regulations around contraception and abortion, uh, you know, back to the 1800s. Prior to 1821, abortions were generally accessible in the United States performed by midwives and doctors. The first state law banning medicinal uh, abortion after quickening, which is four to five months when you can have a fetal movement, uh, was actually in 1821 in the state of Connecticut. That state's gonna come up actually several times in the history. And there was a penalty in that bill in Connecticut for the provider to sentence them with a life sentence if they provided that kind of abortion. Uh, in 1873, the U.S. federal government got involved with the Comstock Act. It was passed, making it a federal crime to sell or distribute contraception through the mail or across state lines. Uh, there's a lot that could be said on the Comstock Act, and maybe it'll come up again tonight, but um, that was the first uh, federal law, and then 24 states have followed that federal law to restrict access. Uh, Connecticut, again, prohibiting uh, using birth control, which was actually in place from 1873 until uh, it was um, um, not upheld by the Supreme Court in 1965. So, um, so, so, um, so still there were women uh, or in the early women's rights movement like Margaret Sanger, who very much believed in birth control and had a free birth control clinic in Brooklyn, New York. It was free. Uh, the police shut it down. She and her colleagues were put in jail for about 30 days, but then she did, uh, put together some uh, birth control um, uh, two organizations that later became Planned Parenthood. In 1936, there was somewhat of a uh, pro uh, repro uh, reproductive rights movement in where a federal court approved an amendment to the Comstock Act, which made it legal for doctors to distribute contraceptives across state lines. The main- um, I can finish this, I've got my Zoom. The, the, the main- uh, the main outcome of this is that it paved the way for advancements in contraceptives. Uh, then we fast forward to 1960 with the first oral contraceptive, the pill, approved by the uh, FDA in 1960. Uh, later on, I won't talk much about this, but in 1998 and 1999, there were other contraceptive uh, pills, uh, morning after and plan B, and I think Deb will talk about this a little bit. 
There is a big ruling in 1965, again, in Connecticut, Griswold versus Connecticut, and they uh, ruled in a 7-2 decision that the U.S. Constitution protects marital privacy rights, striking down the state's contra uh, contraceptive ban for married people. And this decision is also important because it introduces a right to privacy argument, which was later uh, applied in Roe v. Wade. 1969, in 1967, uh, we have the beginning of the women's rights movement, the second women's rights movement, and you have states beginning with Colorado loosening abortion laws and about Colorado and 11 other states decided that there could be exceptions for the mother's mental or physical health, rape, incest, or birth defects. Uh, in 1970, again, women's rights movement heating up in the country, four states actually legalize abortion, Alaska, Hawaii, New York, and Washington. And then we have another landmark decision by the U.S. Supreme Court in the area of reproductive rights when the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a Massachusetts law against distributing contraceptives to unmarried women and men. Again, that cited Eisenstein and Baird, cited the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. We come now to January 22nd, 1973 with Roe v. Wade. And the U.S. Supreme Court, again, 7-2 decision ruling that women's right to abortion was protected under the 14th Amendment and again, uh, goes back to property or goes back to privacy. The concept of personal liberty was broad enough to encompass a woman's decision to terminate her pregnancy. We have another major decision in 1992. Uh, it was Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey. It upholds Roe, and you heard a lot about this when in the discussion of overturning Roe, but it added this undue burden standard, a new standard allowing states to pass laws, making it harder to get an abortion. What we have really since then, and really since 1973, is a chipping away of reproductive rights in this country. So in some ways, maybe it shouldn't have come as a surprise when Roe was overturned. There have been 1,336 abortion restrictions between 1973 and 2021. In 2021, there was 108 of them passed into law and 50 so far in 2022. Over the past 20 years, not only were the uh, state legislators uh, enacting restrictions, but courts have been shifting for the past 20 years to where a lot of anti-abortion politicians named judges with records hostile to reproductive rights, not only on federal courts, but on the U.S. Supreme Court and state courts. Again, Roe was uh, overturned in 2022. And what we have since then, we have 24 states that have banned abortion or are likely to do so. Uh, legal challenges are pending in 12 of those states. And the, the states in orange are the uh, 24 states that have either banned abortion or are likely to do so. And then other uh, in other three states, the courts have blocked a ban. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. As uh, Therese Grant said, we have a great uh, lineup for you tonight, Dr. Deborah Turner. She serves as the 20th National President of the League of Women Voters of the United States. She's also served in leadership positions for the Des Moines Metropolitan League and the League of Women Voters of Iowa. She was briefly in Nebraska and we miss you, Dr. Turner. Uh, Dr. Turner has practiced gynecological oncology for more than 35 years. We have Dr. Amy Bingaman, who is called by her patients, Dr. Amy. She is an OBGYN at Broadlands Medical Center, and among her specialties are infertility, adolescent gynecology care, and LGBTQ plus care. Sally Frank is a professor of law at Drake University, where she focuses on family law, domestic abuse, and gardenership. Her areas of expertise also include women's rights. We have Pete McRoberts. He serves as policy director for the ACLU of Iowa. He is responsible for advancing the organization's broad civil liberties agenda at the Iowa legislature. And finally, we have Maisie Stilwell, who serves as Director of Public Affairs in Iowa for Planned Parenthood of North Central States. And I'm now turning the program over to Dr. T, and she's going to do another introduction about uh, terminology. Thank you very much, Diane. And it's really Exciting to be here tonight with this really distinguished panel. And it's also wonderful to see all my dear friends on the screen here. So it's good to be home. And I'm so excited that the League of Women Voters of Iowa is taking this topic seriously and willing to engage and discuss and learn about the process. Tonight, I'm going to do something straightforward. I apologize, my slides aren't nearly as pretty as Amy's are, but I'm not as good at doing these things. So, but anyway, we're gonna talk about reproductive rights and about abortion. And it's just the facts. It's time that we just talked about the true facts, okay? 
So next slide, please. So I'd like to start out with, um, next slide. Yeah, there you go, thank you. Uh, just the terminology. As we talk about reproductive rights and terminology, we hear a lot of terms uh, spread around and a lot of them are inaccurate. And a lot of them are terms that uh, medical folks do not use. So I thought we'd just briefly talk about the very specific um, things that we talk about, uh, what I mean, terms of abortion and reproductive rights. So abortion, which basically means the loss of a pregnancy before term. And there are two types of abortion. There are induced abortions and there are spontaneous abortions or what is known by the general public and physicians as miscarriage. And that's the unexpected pregnancy loss uh, before viability. So when we're talking about abortion, that's really the basically the two, um, two areas that they fall into, okay? Now, we look at abortion, if we talk about it in the medical world, we talk about abortion by gestational age. And what I mean by gestational age, that means how long you are, how far along you are in pregnancy. And this really becomes critical as we're deciding what care uh, women should get and what appropriate abortion should be and what their problems with pregnancy may be. So your first trimester is up to 13 weeks. Second trimester is 14 to 26 weeks and third trimester is 26 weeks and beyond. And this will become really critical as we talk about actually abortion services and abortion access in our country. Now, earlier I missed talked about a abortion in general. We have an area called missed abortion or incomplete abortion, okay? And what that means is that that is an abortion that, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, uh, where the tissue is not completely passed. And that can be a very life-threatening situation for women. And as the laws in our country have changed, and I'm sure that Dr. Uh, Amy will talk about this a little bit and uh, our lawyer team too will also, that this has become one of the most critical and concerning topics around care around um, pregnancy loss. So the care of women who are Missing abortion, meaning they have tissue left that needs to be removed from the uterus or an incomplete abortion is very a disconcerting and scary disorder, okay? Another thing you're gonna hear talked about is it's an abortive fashion. And this is a substance that causes pre, uh, an abortion or induces abortion. Let me be very clear about this. And this is something that as you're talking about this topic with others, you have to understand plan B, is not an abortion fashion. Plan B stops you, stops you from ovulating an egg being passed, and it can also create the entire, the in, I guess the inside of the uterus, excuse me, to be less compatible to a pregnancy implantation. It does not cause abortion because there is no conception or abortion, uh, pregnancy that is present at the time plan B works. And this is really a critical point and something that you should be very careful about emphasizing as you're talking to others about the abortion landscape. Okay, um, next slide, please. So now we are talking about the types of abortion that we uh, see in our, in our country and Basically, there are two types of abortion. There is the medication abortion, or what we call the pill abortion. And this is done up to 10 weeks by the FDA. And we've got much really good stat studies now that show it's safe up to 11 weeks. And there are some clinics even go up to 12 weeks. The two drugs that are used for the medication abortion are mifepristone, Way back when it first became on, uh, became known, you may remember people talking about RU486, but that was the mifepristone. And then the second drug is the misoprostol. The mifepristone works as the first drug, and it basically stops the preg. We like to say stops the pregnancy from growing. That helps uh, uh, people understand. But basically, it disrupts the pregnancy in such that the pregnancy can no longer can um, attach to the uterine wall. And then the misoprostol causes the uterus to cramp 
and to expel the pregnancy products. So they work together to be effective and together they can be up to 93 to 99% and in most cases, 99% effective if they are taken as prescribed. Methothrexate is another drug that is used in um, pregnancy and also in abortion. This is a drug that many of you, maybe if you have rheumatoid arthritis or other um, autoimmune diseases, you may use this. This is basically a chemotherapy type drug. It's also used importantly in women who have a ectopic pregnancy. It causes, it can cause the ectopic pregnancy basically to, um, for lack of better terms, for a dissolve or be disrupted without causing bleeding. However, it is misprestone and mesoprostol should not be used in the face of an ectopic pregnancy. So we have to be very careful in how we use those pills and we have to understand when each pill is used, okay? The other type of uh, abortion is surgical. And there's basically under surgical, we have aspiration slash suction. That's the uh, form we use in the first and second trimester. Dilatation and evacuation is used primarily in the second and third trimester. And then for those who are sometimes in the late second trimester or up to the third trimester, we can use an induction somewhat similar to what you do when you induce a regular delivery. So. By and large, all abortions can be done safely as outpatients, unless the patient has some other major medical problem, maybe heart disease, or is uh, has bad hypertension, or has a bleeding disorder, or kidney disease. In those cases, they may need to be done in a hospital, but generally speaking, you can do them as an outpatient. Patient comes in, has a procedure done, goes home the same day, and goes back to work the next day, usually or the day after. Now, procedures in the late second trimester may require some uh, observation as an inpatient, and this is up to the physician and the basically the, um, the hospital or the clinic where they're being taken care of. By and large, abortions do not require general anesthesia, nor do we need well-equipped operating pre uh, theaters to um, manage an, a early abortion. In fact, they can be done very safely in an exam room, in the emergency room, as opposed to requiring going to the operating theater. So this is really critical because some people think that this is a medical procedure that needs major medical intervention with um, general anesthesia, and that, that is not the case. Another thing that's really important to impress on people when you talk about abortion. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Sorry there, I just lost my Zoomer. There it goes. Okay, so now we'd like to go to uh, my next slide. Abortion by the numbers, okay? So abortions in 2020, which is the last year we have full uh, data on uh, abortions in the United States. And these are legal induced abortions reported from clinics, hospitals, or doctor's offices in 2020. So there are two big sources of who, who collect this data in the United States. One is the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and the other is the Gut, uh, Gut Matcher Institute. And the, this is a institute that studies and does research on reproductive issues in the United States. So the numbers for abortion in 2020 were, and the reason that the uh, Institute's numbers are a little bit higher than the uh, CDC's is because they have reporting from some of the states that don't require reporting to the CDC. All the CDC reporting is not a federally mandated law. So therefore everybody doesn't have to do that. And one of the states that doesn't necessarily do it on a regular basis is for example, California. So in uh, 2020, there were by, uh, 930,000 or 620,000, somewhere in between those two abortions. So that is 14.4% per thousand women or 11.2% per thousand member de women, depending on which uh, data set you use. 53% of, of abortions now are done with the pill or medication abortion. So they're not even requiring surgical intervention. 20 to 25% of women will undergo an abortion before age 45. 
And that's a very significant number as you think about that. However, the rate of abortion has been slowly decreasing in the United States since the 80s and 90s. There was an upsurge right after uh, Roe was passed and then it has gradually gone away. And actually from 2011 to 2020, the rate decreased by nine to 18%, depending on where you look. So the abortion rates are going down. Uh, there are many reasons for that. And one may be better access to and very better access to contraception and some changes in lifestyle too. But anyway, uh, the numbers are improving. So when we hear these things about, oh, abortion is rampant in the United States, that is not true. Another thing that we have to be very careful to make sure people understand. Next slide, please. So now let's talk a little bit about demographics. So 57.2% of women who get abortions are in their 20s. And very interesting, only 0.2% of the abortions done in the United States are for women under age or women or those who can get pregnant who are under 15 and 3.7 in those who are over age 40. So the majority of them uh, do occur within the ages in the in the second, uh, I mean, in the years in the 20s, excuse me. 86% uh, of women are unmarried when they get them or those who can get pregnant are unmarried when they uh, have an abortion. 14% are married. 32.7% of the um, abortions that are done in the United States are done on non-Hispanic white, 39.2 in non-Hispanic black. Hispanic is 21.1% and non-Hispanic other is 7.7. And the terminology used as I point out this data or talk about these demographics is the terminology that's used in the two reporting sources. So that's why this terminology is used. With gestation at abortion, first trimester, 93% of abortions in the United States are done under age thir under 13 weeks, 93%. So in a very, very safe time. Second trimester is about 6.2% and less than 1% is done over 24 weeks of gestation, less than 1%. About 60.9% women, uh, women or those who get pregnant have had previous births. And when it comes to previous um, abortions, 56 to 58% have never had an abortion. About 24% have had one abortion before. It's down to 10% have had two. And um, about 7.8% women have had more, or those who can get pregnant have had more than three abortions, three plus. The next point is really, really critical. Maternal deaths. The rate of death from abortion in America is 0.43% out of what 0.3% out of 100,000 women. If you look at that compared to live births, the death rate is 23.8% out of 100,000 women. So by and large, it actually is safer to undergo abortion than it is to birth. However, I don't necessarily like to use that statistic unless, you know, unless when we're talking about, um, you know, the real concerns of how safe an abortion is, because we're not about comparing abortion versus live birth. So you choose because of your risk of death. You make decisions regarding, regarding having a birth, going through birthing or having abortion because what's right for you. So it's not a, a trade-off. So I think it's very, we have to be very careful about how we use that statistic, okay? And lastly, I'd like to just dispel a couple myths that you are probably going to hear um, as you talk to others about reproductive health. Abortion does not increase your risk for breast cancer. That is false. There's absolutely no evidence that shows that. Physicians in this country are required to tell that to their patients by many, in many states, however, it is not true. And so most of us, when we, if you work in a state where you have to say that, then you have to qualify that by saying, but medical evidence shows that this is not the case because we can't tell falsehoods to our patients. Abortion does not affect your fertility. We tell women when you have the, or those who get pregnant when they leave the office, just remember you can get pregnant as easily again. And for those who, don't recognize that, we've had them come back having got pregnant before even six weeks past their abortion. 
abortion causes lasting trauma, it does not. There's rumor out there that it gives you like a PTSD type syndrome. There's a lot of emotion around abortion. Women get upset and sometimes they cry. They feel a lot of emotion, just like you do when you have a miscarriage, just like you do when you have a birth. But this is not lasting and the majority of women are very satisfied with the results of the fact that they were had their abortion. In fact, usually when women and those who get pregnant walk out, they say they feel relieved. Abortion is not reversible. Abortion does not cause fetal pain that we're aware of. Looking at all the data and the science, science of pregnancy, it appears that the fetus does not begin to potentially uh, feel pain until 24 weeks of gestation. Abortion is not dangerous, as I pointed out earlier. Like we said, I said abortion does not uh, cause infertility. And I want to emphasize that again, it does not decrease your fertility in any way, unless you have a complication of some kind, like any pregnancy. And finally, the last one, this is one of the ones that's been increasing lately, people who are religious don't get abortions. That has absolutely, and there's totally false. And everybody who comes for an abortion has their own beliefs, has their own life, and has their own decisions about life. And uh, you can be very religious or not religious. Abortion is not about religion. Abortion is not about partisan politics. Abortion is about your personal choice. Thank you. Hey, um, Dr. T, mm -hmm. before we uh, move on, there was one question about one of your slides. Um, is the percentage of women having an abortion before 45 only induced abortion, or does it include spontaneous abortion? Uh, uh, before 45, come again, I guess, ask me the question again. I'm sorry, Amy, yeah. I wasn't. You had on one of your slides um, a statistic about the um, percentage of women needing an abortion before age 45, and they were asking, is that induced abortion, or is that also include miscarriages or spontaneous abortions? That's induced abortion. I'm talking about the percent of women who have the induced abortions, okay? Great. And then one last question. Um, somebody asked, how does maternal death rate compare to before Roe? if you know that. I don't know the exact number and I can certainly find that for you, but the maternal death rate before Roe was uh, significantly higher because we do know that if you have illegal abortions, unsafe abortions, the death rate is significantly higher. And I can find you uh, the specific number on that. I will do that for you, okay? Okay, we're gonna move into the panelist questions now. And for the panelists, I tried to give you a heads up, but we're gonna skip into our second round of questions in the, uh, for time's sake. And that is the first question then is to you, Maisie. What threats to reproductive rights are we currently facing in the Iowa legislature? Thanks, Diane. Um, oh boy. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for having me with you tonight. It's great to see all of you. Um, so the, the threats that we're currently facing in the Iowa legislature. So I'll take uh, just a half step back and say that um, Iowa politicians have introduced more than 70 bills attacking abortion rights since 2011, including a six-week uh, abortion ban in 2018 that was blocked by the courts. Um, that is the same law that Governor Reynolds is now uh, seeking to have the Iowa Supreme Court revive this year. Uh, so majority leaders in the legislature, majority party leaders in the legislature have pledged not to introduce new abortion legislation until the Iowa Supreme Court um, issues their, their decision in that case later uh, this year. Uh, but we know that politicians who want to ban abortion are just chomping at the bit uh, this legislative session, given the, the lack of protections and those that we have lost over, you know, over the past year. Um, so they have already introduced a ban on medication abortion, which here in Iowa actually accounts for 79% uh, um, of all abortions, so much higher than the national average. Um, and these, these lawmakers have also pledged to introduce a total abortion ban as well. We haven't seen that, um, but that is, of course, despite that pledge to, uh, to not 
uh, introduce additional restrictions. Uh, but we know this is all part of an overall goal to ban safe and legal abortion in Iowa. Um, we are we are uh, facing those those proposals right now, but we are also seeing uh, in both the House and Senate. Um, they've introduced omnibus bills that funnel uh, $2 million in taxpayer money to fund anti-abortion centers, uh, which boosts a very costly mom's program that has less than a year under its belt and no publicly uh, released results. Uh, the Iowa Department of Health and Human Services Director uh, Kelly Garcia brought the program with her from Texas, where it ballooned from $5 million in funding in its first year to over $100 million this year. Um, so politicians who are selling these anti-abortion centers as a, a safe alternative to abortion, um, that is certainly far from the truth. They do not provide uh, any actual medical care, but they do fall, uh, push a lot of false uh, religiously laced propaganda on vulnerable people to dissuade them from having an abortion at all costs. Uh, they don't follow HIPAA privacy practices, and they even threaten to disclose pregnancies uh, to partners or other family members if they think that someone is considering an abortion. Uh, I'll also mention there is a proposed constitutional amendment uh, that we have not seen come up yet this session, but that um, that would cement the lack of fundamental right to abortion in our state constitution. And that just has to pass the Iowa House and Senate once more, either this year, as I said, we haven't seen that come up yet this year, but it can also pass next year uh, before going to a statewide vote. Um, so finally, we know that additional abortion bans are certainly coming as soon as that Iowa Supreme Court um, ruling comes down, whether they uh, uh, you know, affirm that ruling or allow a new one to be passed, but we're certainly um, expecting that. I don't want the lack of, of current action on abortion bans to make people think that they're forgetting about us. They most certainly are not, um, but we we are certainly watching closely and, and tracking all of these um, moving pieces to make sure that folks are aware of what's happening uh, over at the Capitol. Okay, thanks, Maisie. Pete, let's go next to you. You also have a similar lobbyist role there at the Iowa legislature. You're an sure. attorney, but you also do a lot of public policy. And uh, so can you give us a little bit about your perspective, kind of bouncing off what Maisie just said about your assessment of the current and future status of reproductive rights in Iowa? Yeah, first, I want to associate myself with everything Maisie said. And second, thanks, everybody, for asking my organization to be a part of this, and particularly to Dr. Turner, it's uh, told you a couple of months ago, it was good to see you again. And that, that's the case for you and everybody else here. So thank you. Uh, but with regard to the substance, you know, I want to echo Maisie's point and then I want to dig in for just a moment on the, the amendment. So as, as Maisie mentioned, there's pending litigation and a pending ruling from the Iowa Supreme Court that will give guidance to legislators that they currently don't have. So what we all understand is that whether it's Governor Reynolds or the legislative majority, they all have some policy agenda that includes either restricting or banning abortion. And that's, that's, nobody can argue with that. They ran for election on it. The open question is what would the Supreme Court allow and what wouldn't they? And so there's a procedural case that Maisie mentioned that it's not only procedural, but, but uh, to, to her point, the governor's office has tried to resurrect a previous ban that was thrown out under kind of a novel legal theory. So the issue is they've got to answer a threshold question about whether or not it's, it's lawful under the constitution to reinstate a law that was thrown out before they get to the question of whether or not the law itself was constitutional. So there's a lot of stuff at the Supreme Court. That's the issue. So this is why the legislature is tapping their brakes on uh, any possible restriction. So the head of the Iowa Senate, the head of the Iowa House of Representatives have all said explicitly that they're not going to run any law relative to abortion rights. Governor Reynolds said this as well in her campaign for election. So I think that's true. And the reason why is because let's just imagine this. Let's say that the legislature passed a new law that didn't have the procedural defects of the one they're trying to resurrect. Let's say they did that, which they could do. They could do it tomorrow. And, and then all of a sudden now, they put a clean issue in front of the Supreme Court that may get in the way of their longer term agenda of either a favorable court ruling 
or a favorable amendment. And, and that's where they're at. So right now, the Iowa Supreme Court over the summer, a week before Dobbs, reduced uh, the, the uh, rights for an abortion in Iowa for women. They, they lowered it to what at that time was the federal standard. So undue burden. I don't want to get too legal, but, but uh, the, the point is they, they kept Iowa's protections in place that were at that time consistent with the federal uh, law under Casey, so the, the successor to Roe. Well, had they waited a week, maybe they wouldn't have. But the deal is the Iowa Supreme Court issues their rulings based upon their independent rating of the Iowa Supreme Court, the Iowa, I'm sorry, the Iowa Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. So it's anybody's guess what the Supreme Court would do in a post-Dobbs environment. We don't know. So that's, neither does the legislature. And that's the issue. So right now of the seven Iowa Supreme Court justices, four of them have at one point or the other in the last eight years voted for the undue burden standard of Casey, which is still current law in Iowa. They get there for wildly different reasons. Some of them look like they got there because, well, this is federal law, so we got to comply. The other ones have used that as a counterpoint to the fundamental right ruling, which they subsequently overruled. But the point is the legislature is as much in the dark as we are, I think, which means I don't see any likelihood that they pass a substantive abortion-related regulation between now and the ruling on the, the, the immediate case before the Supreme Court. Ain't going to happen. Okay, so what then? To Maisie's point, and expanding on it, the legislature, the members of the legislature, Governor Reynolds, they have not tried to hide the ball in their position. They've been explicit about it. Two weeks ago at the Iowa legislature, two new legislators spoke, notably no committee chairs, nobody with, with a lot of influence, but one of them said they wanted a life at conception bill. Governor Reynolds has reiterated her support. And the reality is Governor Reynolds won in a, in, in a clear and convincing way. Legislators came back with increased majorities in the Iowa House of Representatives and the Iowa Senate so from their perspective, they didn't hide the ball. They ran on this. Nobody, nobody was in the dark as to what happened with Dobbs. They were all there and they got elected with larger numbers. And yet they're still not gonna run an abortion restriction. So this is where uh, I have something to add that I hope is, is helpful. There's gotta be some release of pressure inside the legislature. There just has to be. There's there too many of them uh, are true believers. They are the photo negative of us, right? They they actually believe it. It's not transactional. It's not uh, pure politics. It's they ran for office on this specific issue, and now they're in charge. So what are they going to do? And I think that they let the amendment loose. So to Maisie's uh, following up on Maisie's point, there's a proposed amendment, and in Iowa, the Constitution can only be amended through a long, long process. It takes multiple. Uh, sessions of the General Assembly. So those are two-year increments. So uh, in the last General Assembly, they passed an amendment that would, and, and, it, and it's odd. If, if anybody wants to read it, 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 they'll see that it's unusual in how it's done. It does some kind of uh, public relations in the first sentence of the amendment. It's, it's for the dignity and health of this and this and this. It's a preamble, but at the same time, it's still, it's still there. And then it simply states that there is no right to an abortion in Iowa, a right to public funding of an abortion. That's the amendment. And the legislature passed it once. Like Maisie said, it doesn't have to go to the governor again. They just have to pass it through both chambers. And then it goes to the ballot, assuming they don't do anything differently, in November of next year. So tomorrow, if the legislature chose, they could pass this amendment and get it on the ballot. And I think, all things being equal, if what the legislature's intention is, is don't rock the boat with the court, wait until they know what the court does. Uh, what, what does them less harm? And that's why I think they run the amendment because you can vote for that amendment and make a, you can factually tell your local newspaper editor, your local uh, reporter, your constituents that, hey, look, I didn't ban abortion. All I did was decide that it should be your decision as a voter. And even then, it, you know, the amendment doesn't ban abortion, but it, 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 it prevents the Supreme Court from finding any right. So in some respects, it's clever the way they did it. In some respects, it's very ham-handed because if you look at the, 
a language of the amendment, well, you might you might see that and, and from one perspective think, oh yeah, well, this doesn't say anything about abortion rights themselves. But on the other end, you might say, if they wanted an exception for rape, if they wanted an exception for the life of the mother, if they wanted an exception for incest, it would be a, it would be there and it ain't. So this is the type of conversation people need to have amongst themselves. And the question is, all the things that the vast majority of people think about and consider, regardless of how you feel on the spectrum of, of your support for abortion rights or not, regardless, the question is, if you believe that whatever restriction there is, that there should be uh, an, an avenue for, for health, for life, for rape, for instance, et, et cetera, if you should be the exceptions, look for them in that amendment, you won't see them. So every time people try to soften the blow of what this amendment does, just remember, it's an explicit grant of power to the legislature to do whatever they choose at any given moment. And I think people see that. You know, the, the support for exceptions, again, regardless of whether you would call yourself pro-choice, call yourself pro-life, I mean, it's, it's, the numbers are there. People who are voting against abortion, nonetheless, abortion rights, still support exceptions on certain reasons. Most of them do. So look for those exceptions. And if you don't see them, then you, you, you know exactly the type of pass that, that the legislature is asking voters to give them. And that's where we're at in terms of political movements. And remember, like Maisie said, the legislature, will, the same legislature will be back next year. And again, we're, we're as nonpartisan as can be. I, I don't, it does, doesn't matter to me who's in charge. That's just how it is. The number of people who support further restrictions on, on abortion, uh, who support further restrictions on women's rights is, is easily, you know, 55 members of the Iowa House of Representatives, 30 members of the Iowa Senate, and that's a majority. So <clears throat> once they get their guidance from the Supreme Court, Katie bar the door, but I think they're gonna run the amendment in the meantime. Okay, let's move on. Again, another attorney on our panel uh, from Drake University, Professor Frank. Again, a legal perspective, but um, what are the privacy implications in your view of reproductive rights legislation in Iowa? Well, what we have right now is the, that the court upheld last year in overturning the prior uh, protections in Iowa is a 72 hour waiting period. And that really affects women, affects people who want abortions because they have to come to a clinic twice schedule appointments twice if they live far away, if they have trouble getting off from work, the ability to do that without people knowing that people you don't want to know, knowing that you've had an abortion is harder because of all of the extra expense and time to get to the clinic two times. Um, we also have a 20 week ban that is in effect before viability. We still um, are not allowed to have an abortion after 20 weeks. Some of the major concerns looking at what's going on in other states is the method of enforcement. Years ago, um, a baby was born and then murdered at a very early time. And there was a county attorney who tried to get uh, pregnancy records from all of the doctors in the area and Planned Parenthood to determine who it was that might have given birth to this child and killed it. Uh, that can give you a foretaste of what could happen in the future. People's Facebooks have been examined. Uh, they, gov state governments have looked at, uh, there are now apps on phones to follow your menstrual cycle. Uh, certainly nothing I ever saw or knew, and it's uh, nothing I would use at this point in my age. But uh, those menstrual cycle records can be subpoenaed by um, county attorneys. Google searches can be subpoenaed. So if they want to say, somebody says, hey, I thought this person was pregnant and now they're not pregnant and we want to see what's happened, um, they can start looking at the menstrual cycle apps. They can look at Google searches the person has done. They can try, cars now have tracking in information that you could follow a person and see where they've driven. To all to try to track down this, did this person go somewhere to have an abortion? Um, I could go longer, but we were asked to keep it to two minutes. So I'm gonna stop there. All right, thank you, Professor Frank. We're gonna move now to Dr. T, Dr. Turner. 
Uh, we know that such legislation impacts a woman's choice for an abortion. However, reproductive freedom doesn't stop at abortion. What other medical issues does lack of choice impact? Well, um, first of all, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the crises that we're seeing right now across the country uh, throughout many emergency rooms and in clinics is the issues surrounding spontaneous abortion and also incomplete abortion. When you have an incomplete abortion, you have one goal. And it doesn't matter if it came from an induced abortion or a spontaneous abortion, is to get the tissue out of the uterus. If the tissue stays in the uterus uh, for a significant period of time, a couple things can happen. One, you can get an infection. In certain situations, you can also get a disorder called DIC where you start bleeding a lot. But more critically and really important is that you can bleed. And uh, Dr. Amy, I'm sure can speak to this, but one of the greatest risks of pregnancy and one of the reasons that women die both in labor and in spontaneous in abortions in that is because of hemorrhage. And that is a really concerning thing because doctors are becoming afraid to treat women if they're having hemorrhage because they assume maybe they had an abortion and if they uh, do a DNC or they do a procedure that um, removes any tissue that may be in the uterus that this might be considered forming abortion and which is very scary. The other things that uh, I, and there are the issues around, for example, if you, um, hypertension, if you have a significant hypertensive disorder and you can't have an abortion, you could go into hypertensive crisis and this could cause you, cause your death. You know, you could have, if you had a medical disorder that is risky to carry a pregnancy, and there are many medical disorders that are that situation, things like renal disease, kidney disease, uh, heart disease, these can all be actually threatened by a pregnancy. And therefore, in order for it to save your life or decrease your risk of having persistent chronic disease, then you need to have the, you need to have an abortion. And finally, uh, there are many other things, but I think I would like everybody to turn to something. And I hope you'll all go out and look up something called the turn away study. Turn away, like, you know, turn you away. And this was a study that was done by an organization called, and I always have to look up the name, and I apologize, it, Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health. And that's a group out of um, University of California, San Francisco. And they did a study where they looked at a group of women who were turned away from having an abortion who came, and they were like one to three weeks past the gestational age, that's why they were turned away, and women who were able to get their abortions. And they followed them for five years. So they got really good data and they were very, very clear at following them up. And the things that they found out were very startling. First of all, these women were more likely to experience serious complications at the end of their pregnancy, including preeclampsia, that's the or eclampsia, that's a hypertensive problem, and death. They were more likely to stay tethered to abusive partners. And you know, the medical issues that come around with having an abusive partner is, are very critical. They were more likely to suffer anxiety and loss of self-esteem. They were less likely to have aspirational life plans. They lost the ability for that. They were more likely to experience poor physical health for years after their pregnancies, including chronic pain and gestational hypertension. And the study also find, found, and this is very interesting, that denying abortion had serious implications for the children born of unwanted pregnancies because of uh, the situation that the um, person who bore the child lived in and their underlying medical conditions, it threatened the health and well-being. So the lack of having turning away from Rome has more implications than just, and I don't say just, in, but more implications in the fact that you can't get an abortion because if you can't get an abortion, it can cause many other problems. All right, thank you. Now we will move to Dr. Amy. Uh, Dr. Amy, as an OBGYN in Iowa, how is the threat to reproductive rights affecting your practice? 
First, I'd like to thank the panel and Dr. Turner for including me with this esteemed group of people. Um, and thanks to everyone taking time out of their day to come join us for this conversation. Um, I have to say I was born in 1974. So I grew up with the privilege of choice, including in my personal life when I had an unplanned pregnancy at the age of 16. And through the vast majority of my professional life, I've had the privilege of choice for my patients. I would not have thought that this would be a spot we were sitting at. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is unplanned pregnancies are a reality in the United States of America. And unplanned pregnancies will always occur because every contraceptive method on the market has a failure rate. So what I'm finding how that's translating into my practice is I have some very responsible moms who are bringing their young virginal patients to me for long acting contraception because they're worried about what is going to be available to their children down the road. So I'm putting in a lot more IUDs under sedation because that's the only way I'm gonna put it in a virgin unless they're remarkably mature because it is very uncomfortable. A lot more Nexplanons um, for patients who aren't even really thinking about becoming sexually active yet. I have a large LGBTQ population, um, many of whom have zero chance of getting pregnant if they're only voluntarily having sex. But so many in this patient population are petrified of rape and an unplanned pregnancy that they're asking me to put them under general anesthesia to remove their tubes to take away the possibility of an unplanned pregnancy by a rape and being forced to carry a pregnancy that quite frankly, some feel would kill them. I'm also putting a lot more long acting contraception in my special needs patients. So special needs patients, I adore them. They're one of my favorite patient populations to care for. We know that they have a higher rate of sexual abuse. So a lot of caregivers know this fact and they're scared for their loved ones. And so we're putting long acting contraception in both for menstrual suppression, but also the perk of very reliable contraception. I just saw a patient this week, her and her husband were thrilled to be pregnant and it turned out to be a missed abortion, which means she came for her first visit and the baby did not have a heartbeat. They opted to do medical induced abortion of this pregnancy, and she ended up hemorrhaging on her toilet. She passed out. The husband had to call 911. She came in. She had an emergency DNC, and she's done fine. Seeing them in their post-op, they are unsure if they want to get pregnant in the future in Iowa because they're afraid that they won't be able to have a DNC if they have another pregnancy without a heartbeat that they will be forced to miscarry at home with the risk of hemorrhage, need for 911, and the potential of no one being able to intervene for them. So quite frank, oh, one other caveat, the poor are who is going to be massively affected by this as well. So Title 19 has paperwork that we have to fill out for our patients to be sterilized. There is a reason behind this. Um, in the United States of America, it is very distressing to most of us in healthcare, but some poor and disabled in this country were sterilized without their consent. So because of that, there are laws in place that women who have Title 19 wanting to be sterilized have to be 21 years of age at the time that they sign the consent form, and we have to wait at least 30 days until we perform that procedure. This law was instituted to protect people, but now it's just one more barrier to health care for our poor individuals. For instance, I had a patient who delivered her third baby and she turned 21 years old five days after the delivery and I could not tie her tubes until she signed the paperwork five days later and then we scheduled her 30 days later for her sterilization. But unplanned pregnancies can occur in that time frame. So long and short, Abortions, healthcare, unplanned pregnancies will never go away. We need to fight really hard to keep this in place for the women in the United States of America. Thank you, Dr. Amy. 
So I'm going to skip over to, um, Pete told us a lot about the uh, Iowa Supreme Court and what he thinks might happen there. So I'm going to skip to Professor Frank and to talk a little bit about how do actions of other states uh, around the country impact Iowa, in your view? Well, there are a lot of attempts in states to try to get extraterritorial um, authority over abortions so that if somebody, let's say from Texas, came to Iowa for an abortion and abortion was, were legal in Iowa, would te Texas might want to try to exert jurisdiction and charge the Iowa doctor with committing a crime, even though the patient, it's legal in Iowa. You now, states like um, California, Connecticut, New York, have specifically passed legislation saying they're not going to obey those kinds of um, efforts. They're going to protect the people in their state. Iowa is not going to sign such a pass such a law at this point. So um, there's also issues of whether you can get medication abortion by mail, and um, where do you have to be when you order it? Where do you have to be when you receive it? So there's a lot of those kinds of implications that can affect Iowa and can affect the legal delivery in Iowa, uh, the aiding and abetting that states have, where you can't aid and abet an abortion or help them, well, if I help them get to Iowa, and is that violating the Texas or the Utah statute? And there are even bans on mentioning abortion. In Utah, academics, professors have been told they could be charged with felonies for having in an academic discussion about abortion. Uh, so there, it's really affecting every which way. And I just wanna in, mention to people, in, if anyone wants to ask a question about how these laws are impacting the free exercise of religion for, people, for those religious people who do not oppose abortion, I'd be glad to address that, but I will stop there. Thanks, Professor Frank. We're gonna move back to you, Dr. Turner. And I wanna ask a question about the Emergency Medical Treatment and uh, Active Labor Act. And, you know, patients have concerns about their care in emergency rooms. Could you tell us a little bit about this law and what it means to you? Uh, sure, I would be happy to. And I will tell you a little bit about the law. And then I am going to ask my um, lawyer friends to weigh in because this is a really, really critical piece and I sure, uh, Dr. Amy agrees with this. So the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act was passed in 1986. And basically what it says is that if someone comes to an emergency room and they're asking for emergency care, that emergency room is required to do an examination and determine if they have an emergent, emergent situation and then make sure they are stabilized. And if it's emergency enough, treat them at that time. And the reason for this law was because there were rampantly in the United States, uh, people would show up at emergency rooms and if they had unfortunately something which was called a negative wallet biopsy, which was kind of this euphemism for they had no money, they were not, that they would then be transferred to another, uh, hospital or sent to go to another hospital without being seen or without being treated. And because of this, as you can well imagine, many, many people uh, died in transfer or got to the other hospital and were so critically ill that they had, they ended up with chronic problems. The law also says that you, any hospital, and this has to be for hospitals that obviously take Medic Medicare and Medicaid. And it also says that if you are a hospital that receives funds from these federal programs, then you have to accept patients who have been stabilized somewhere and have an emergency, you need to accept them. So what have, we've been seeing happen is we have this issue around a woman comes in, just like Dr. Amy just talked about, who is bleeding profusely. And this is happening all across the country now. This is not a imaginary situation. And she's bleeding from a... A, B, be it spontaneous or induced. And just so everybody knows, you can't tell if a uh, loss of pregnancy uh, abortion is spontaneous or induced by examining the patient or looking at the patient, you know, unless you see some very specific significant trauma, which is rare indeed, there's no way you can tell the difference, all right? 
people are being sent away from emergency rooms because maybe the physician wants to treat them, but the hospital has said no, either it's because we are a hospital that has a religious affiliation that doesn't allow us to do this, or it's because we're afraid that we will be charged and we have got a case against us if we allow you to treat them, or physicians are afraid to treat them because they're afraid to lose their license if they take care of someone and it turns out to be like a um, abortion. So my question to our lawyers is that there's, I think there was an interesting, um, which state is it, in Texas that has a preliminary injunction against this law regarding, you know, following the EMTALA requirement so that their hospitals would not have to do this. And my question to the lawyers is, is this enforceable and are we going to see this as an increasing problem in our country? And um, mm -hmm. the Biden administration was certainly pulling out that law, pointing to that law as one of the arguments and one of the fe federal tools to try to uh, make sure women have the health care access they need. Uh, so, of course, and this gets to the question that Diane didn't ask at the beginning, but the politics of judges, um, the number of absolute right wing and even unqualified judges that were appointed under Trump has increased so much. So the judge shopping, bringing these cases, the right is bringing these cases to judges they think will be sympathetic with them. And that's how they got an injunction in Texas. There's even a case in Texas now trying to challenge the FDA's approval of the abortion medication abortion drugs. So, and of course it's brought in Texas in a district where the main district judges have been were appointed by Trump. But it seems like there will be the, that that statute would require that medical care the problem is that the doctors might deny that that's what the medical care is necessary. Doctors are having to have their lawyers on speed dial yeah. all over the country. And lawyers are not the ones who should be making medical decisions. Doctors should be. And patients will die and do die when doctors have to postpone out of fear that they'll be imprisoned. And I'm not blaming the doctors for it. I'm blaming the statutes for it. Can I pop in there? This is the, the point you made about the judge shopping is huge. That's a Memphis Person case, and they can literally go anywhere. So this is an organization, and their entire agenda is going from jurisdiction to jurisdiction to challenge abortion rights statutes. This is the same organization that that uh, my uh, office is is litigating against on the 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 six week abortion ban case, the the resurrection of it. So this is really it's an important thing, and and and. On, on the state angle, this is to your point about doctors needing to have their lawyers in, these laws are badly written. So for instance, when we, when we hear people talk colloquially about exceptions for rape and incest and so forth, the exceptions that the Iowa legislature has passed, according to them, those don't exist anywhere else in Iowa code. There is no crime of rape in Iowa, and yet that's the word that's used in the exception. There's sexual abuse, assault, and so forth. There, there, there's an exception for incest, but incest as a crime in the state of Iowa is very limited to certain degrees of relation. So this is, I, I, I'm emphasizing your point, and I don't mean to be repetitive, but these laws are badly written. And, and if, if you're a doc and if you're a lawyer, you don't know what the outcome is. So this is why I'm deeply concerned. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've heard legislators, members of Congress, governors talk for years about, well, we want X, Y, Z exceptions. And my, my response is, well, where are they in law? And they're not. So even in the state of Iowa, like, you know, the exceptions that people approve of, again, colloquially or politically, <laughs> you tell me what they mean. So yeah, that, 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 that's a huge, huge, huge problem. Okay, turning the page a little bit now, and, and Dr. Amy, you mentioned this a little bit in your response to the last question I asked you, but anything else you might want to add about how the threat to reproductive rights in Iowa affects those marginalized and talking about LGBTQ community, refugees, domestic violence victims, and even uh, those who are economically disadvantaged? 
So I do think that this pop, the marginalized population are the ones who will suffer the greatest. Um, specifically the trans population, the idea of pregnancy to a trans male identifies as male is so incredibly distressing to those patients. They already have a really challenging time finding good health care um, across the United States, unfortunately included in Iowa. So upwards of almost 50% of trans patients have reported having to teach their healthcare providers how to provide medical care. 24% um, have reported being verbally harassed in healthcare facilities. So we've already put large barriers of care um, for them to seek screening prevention and everything that goes with it. So I think they're already less likely to come see us because of the way they've been treated. Refugees, I think, are more likely to have suffered trauma, including rape and potentially unplanned pregnancies on their way to the United States. Domestic violence victims have a real issue for access to contraception, particularly if they're financially dependent on an abusive partner and reliant upon their insurance, which is why I feel strongly that freestanding places like Planned Parenthood should exist so that patients can receive contraception and care without utilizing a partner's insurance if it's a domestic violence situation. So they're less likely to get contraception, higher risk of having an unplanned pregnancy. And one of the things that we do know is victims of domestic violence, domestic violence escalates with pregnancy. So that unplanned pregnancy in a domestic violence abuse situation, that woman's life is at even higher risk with pregnancy because that domestic violence escalates. The economically disadvantaged, I think this is huge. If you don't have enough money to feed the children you already have and you have an unplanned pregnancy, I think desperate people are going to take desperate measures if we don't have safe and accessible options for them. Thanks, Dr. Amy. Now we'll move to Maisie. And this is uh, a question I think that comes up and I'm gonna include Nebraska in it as well, Maisie, is that, uh, what are you seeing uh, from Planned Parenthood North Central uh, about the influx of patients that we could be seeing currently in Iowa and Nebraska um, due to interstate travel? Absolutely. So we have, uh, you know, since the Dobbs decision uh, came out overturning Roe v. Wade, we have absolutely seen um, an increase in patients from out of state traveling um, to our five state affiliate, which includes Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, um, specifically in Iowa, Minnesota, and Nebraska. That Those are the only uh, three states of the five where abortion remains legal. Um, these patients are coming from across the country. We have seen patients from places like Texas, Florida, Louisiana, um, and this influx along with the medically unnecessary 24-hour uh, uh, mandatory waiting period that went into effect last year. Uh, so now two visits are required for, uh, for abortion care has also led to longer waiting periods in our health centers. And so as a result, our affiliate has actually seen a 40% increase in second trimester abortions because of these barriers to care. Um, but we have certainly been planning for this and put additional supports in place uh, to be able to support abortion patients to get the care that they need. We have patient navigators who connect uh, pregnant people with appointments and financial support that's needed for daycare, uh, their own care, transportation, time off of work. Um, and certainly Planned Parenthood is committed to providing patients with the health with the health care that they need and will continue our fight to do so. Okay, thanks, Maisie. Okay, Dr. Turner again, and, and this question's kind of been answered in some of the answers to other questions, but anything else that you want to add about the threat to reproductive rights affecting birth control, sterilization, family planning? I actually just read something today on Twitter from uh, someone in Nebraska that talked about it was a doctor whose patients couldn't get drugs at either Walmart or Walgreens because the fear that these drugs were going to be used in some way for an abortion, even though abortion is illegal in Nebraska. And so what other, other things could you add to the threat to birth control, sterilization, family planning? Right, and, and that's a very 
that's a very important issue that the one you just brought up and one that I've seen and I've actually seen it play out where, you know, the it's very interesting about our willingness to allow people to practice the professions that they have chosen and to the best of their ability and in the way they think is correct. And this really has stymied the practice of physicians, obviously, as they're getting more and more challenged. But the place where we're really noticing it a lot is in pharmacies. Because in order to, when you write a prescription, you have to have a reason for the right of prescription. So when we write a prescription and we write, you know, uh, penicillin for something or the other, you have to have codes that you put on so that they can uh, go back and say, this is what this was for. So, you, so the insurance companies, quite frankly, will pay for it, okay? So when it comes to prescribing drugs like uh, Mifeprex um, and Misoprostol, it becomes really problematic. Now, currently you can't just go to a pharmacy and get Mifeprex. Mifeprex is pretty much basically um, given out at a center or a clinic where they are doing the abortion or doing the medical abortion. But misoprostol, which is the second drug and really critical in like a medical abortion, is a drug that's also used for like ulcer treatment, okay? But if a young woman comes in with a prescription for misoprostol, uh, many times the pharmacist will assume that you're getting this for an abortion. And in many places, they've been able to turn, turn these patients away. So it's been really, so the issue around uh, contraception, of course, is, you know, one, will pharmacies honor your prescriptions? The other thing is that we talked about that myth of saying um, the um, plan B causes abortion, and that's what it does. That, as we know, is not the truth. That's a myth that we have to get rid of. However, it, if it's believed that that is the case, once again, if you go to the pharmacy to get plan B, many pharmacies, you could just buy it over the counter. There are pharmacies now that keep it behind the counter or require you, are trying to require you to have some kind of proof that you should, you need the plan B. So that's gonna decrease, you know, and that's the morning after pill, by the way, I think most of us probably know that, but uh, that's one of the things. And then when it comes to sterilization, it's very interesting and, uh, Dr. Amy may also have some thoughts about this, but the question of, first of all, you can't do a sterilization, you're not supposed to do a sterilization if somebody is pregnant, okay? And it depends on how far, when their last period was and many things like that. So physicians are becoming even more leery about who do you sterilize, when can you sterilize them? And um, Amy's, uh, Dr. Amy's issues around sterilization and age are really critical because there are many physicians out there who already would not sterilize a patient until they've had a pregnancy. So we're going to see these things happening. We're seeing laws being in, you know, written in states that are going to limit the access to birth control and hospitals that are going to limit the access to things like sterilization because there are already hospitals who will not do sterilization, period. One thing, and I'll throw this out and then I'll get off here. Real critical, the one thing we haven't talked about is education. And what my biggest concern is that we can stime, uh, you know, try to uh, fight all the laws and keep pro uh, choice available in given states. But if we can't educate medical providers, nurses, doctors, and other medical providers, on how to handle and how to take care of reproductive situations, pregnancy, early pregnancy, early pregnancy loss, do abortions. If they can't learn to do the abortions within their training programs, it's gonna be really difficult if there's nobody out there that knows how to do these things. And that is a significant, significant problem. And the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology is really concerned about that too. So I, I needed to throw that out there. That's going to lead me to a couple follow-up questions. Uh, I was first going to do Dr. Amy, but I'm going to save it, Dr. Amy, and I'm going to throw this out to the two attorneys. And you both have addressed um, what Dr. Turner talked about today, the, 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 the case in uh, Texas with the methoprosone. I can't say this, uh, methoprosone. 
uh, talked about that. Dr. Uh, Professor Frank, he also talked about uh, doctors being afraid to uh, uh, perform abortions because of the penalties in the law. So let's go first with you. Like, what do you see from the legal aspects uh, of what Dr. Turner was just talking about, uh, about the, the lack of access to just basic family planning and other um, uh, reproductive rights? And let's well, I go think with Professor Frank to first. I think part of the movement against abortion is really a movement to have women have more children, at least to have white, middle, and upper class women have more children. And so that's part of why there's a move against family planning and all of those other things. But um, when we talk about sterilization, which is a part of reproductive health care and issues, we also have to remember it's not just old times ancient times where um, doctors have been voluntarily sterilized people. We had a report, I think it was in 2021, of a Texas immigration jail, immigration prison, where women were being taken to a doctor and he was involuntarily sterilizing them. So it's really, for the, on that issue, it's so hard to thread the needle because we want to protect people from being involuntarily sterilized, but we also want people to be able to be sterilized if they want it. And it's a, it's hard to write laws that protect on both sides. Uh, so I, I think that's a, a very difficult area in that sense and not as clear as, at least to me, as my opposition to laws that are limiting access to birth control, limiting access to abortion. And um, when Pete was talking about unclear laws, there was just an article, I think in the New York Times, may have been in the Post, about a woman who was, whose child had, I think it was, po whose, I'm sorry, not child, whose fetus had Potter's syndrome. And under and that would cause, if, if she gave birth, the child would die within minutes, maximum live 20 minutes. And the doctors, their first thought was, it fit the law because of fetal deformity to allow an abortion. And then they looked at it and the law was written so badly that they couldn't decide that it in fact fit that law. So this poor woman and her husband who decided they would have an abortion because of that fetal deformity is having to go through with the birth and the psychological problems, the all of the trauma of giving birth in that situation. Uh, is there. And I think that's the kind of thing when our lawmakers say, oh, we're giving exceptions to these things. No, they're not. Because as Pete said, they're not writing the law in terms of medical terms. They're writing the law in other ways and nobody can figure out what it means. Kate, either you or uh, Sally mentioned the case in Texas that's with a, a very uh, pro uh, sort of anti-abortion judge. And Tell us a little bit about what you think about that case, how it might be decided, and how then that would affect uh, Iowa, all states, actually. I guess I, uh, Pete, I think you're trying to answer, but you have your mute. Yep, you're right. You're right. Sorry. My trifocals don't let me see if my mute is on or not. It's <laughs> so sorry. Uh, this is a case that was filed, I think, in the Northern District of Texas that would, would uh, require the uh, revisiting of a 20 year old FDA rule with regard to mifepristone. And uh, this is to, to Sally's point about judge shopping, that's that's what it is. And so, uh, you know, it's it's impossible to overstate the effect of that. Um, it's the Alliance Defending Freedom, which, which uh, brought the action just an hour and a half ago, they were denied uh, the, the stay pending trial. So there's some good news there. I can't predict where it goes, but but uh, it, it's real. And you know, the, the again, not being a partisan, um, elections have consequences. And whether it's a governor of a state or a president of the United States, they have extraordinary power to impact the judiciary for a generation. And so, uh, for issues that people care about, you know, <laughs> we got to take these this this into account. I mean, the reason why that these, these uh, judicial districts and the circuits have the judges they do is because of an election. And so the legal question is up in the air. And, and I, I can't predict what, what uh, the Supreme Court would do or what the appeals court would do. This administration has been, has been very open. They've, they expanded 
the availability of mifepristone uh, that was first expanded as a result of COVID. They then made the, the president made the rule permanent in January of this year. But again, there's there's judges all over the country, and um, I, I I hope I'm not partisan by saying this, but qualifications was not at the real top of the list on on uh, who got appointed to which uh, judicial positions here in the past administration. So yeah, you, this this stuff's going to bruise us for a long time. Can you or Sally explain though that why would this judge this concept of a federal court can impact? So it'll compact the whole country. That's, I think, the thing that people don't understand. Sure. That, so I this, think that's a real critical piece here that some of us just don't get. It's interesting you bring that up because in, in the, the thick of the Trump years, there was a movement to limit district court, uh, federal judges' rulings or, or uh, uh, protective orders to the district itself. But that's not the law. <laughs> and so five years ago, it was, well, if you're in you know, this liberal district, uh, can you really be limited to this geographic area because that's the circuit you're in uh, and now it's well but now it's a conservative district so uh, it's national but yeah the, the the district court judge when they they uh, issue a ruling it it's it's everywhere in, until uh, uh, until a superior court decides thank you Amy uh, dr. Amy uh, dr. Turner talked a little bit about physicians and pharmacists, you know, basically practicing under these threats to reproductive uh, rights. And I know one of the concerns here in Nebraska among a group of uh, female physicians that have joined together to oppose legislation here is the recruitment and retention of OBGYNs in uh, Nebraska. How's that playing out in Iowa? Well, first of all, you know, during medical school, you first pick your specialty you want to go into. And I think that medical students may be hesitant to choose a practice where you don't get to actually take care of your patients with full scope. So I think that's the first part that it starts out is with medical school training and getting students to want to go into OBGYN residencies, which is already um, got its issues for students wanting to go into it because of our time commitment and the hours that we work. And then once you do get adequately trained OBGYNs, if there are states that limit women's reproductive rights, they may opt to not come to those so that they can practice full scope of care for their patients and not worry about losing their license, jail time, or fines for saving a patient's life. So I think, um, I love Iowa. I'm not from Iowa, but it's the longest I've ever lived anywhere to this time. Um, but most of us don't feel like we have to stay here if there's other states that we're able to practice full scope of obstetrics and gynecology. Okay, thank you. I think this will be my final question before we move into questions from the audiences, and it's for Maisie. And this is a thing maybe to end on a, I don't know if I'd call it a positive note, but what do you think are the best ways that we can talk to our friends and family about abortion rights? Thank you. I love this question. Um, abortion stigma is a huge barrier uh, that we face and in, in, that we have to overcome in this fight to protect reproductive freedom in Iowa. Um, abortion is, as as we've learned tonight, abortion is very common. It's very safe. Um, and, you know, one in four women will have an abortion, meaning that most people know and love someone who has had an abortion. Uh, but people are afraid to speak out because of the shame and judgment that is so often associated with abortion. And that's where we see myths about abortion go unchallenged and these dangerous policies get passed. Um, we are we are fully immersed in this work, uh, but we also know that so many Iowans don't know their own reproductive rights and, and bodily autonomy are on the line, and that abortion could be outlawed um, in Iowa this year. Um, abortion is not a dirty word, and we shouldn't be afraid to say it. Um, so the, the latest Iowa poll that I love to talk about found that 61% of Iowans want abortion to uh, be safe and legal in most or all cases. Um, that was uh, asked to Iowans using the word abortion. It's not, not a, a dirty word. Um, so you will certainly find many more friends than enemies in these conversations. 
Um, we do certainly have entire trainings on how to talk about abortion specifically and, and the best ways to do that. But I will say just on a, on a surface level, talking about um, you know, reproductive freedom and bodily autonomy um, are, are things that most people uh, tend to agree on and certainly reminding folks that we should be able to make personal medical decisions without the interference of politicians and judges. Um, so those are those are widely agreed upon principles that I would encourage you to use. And ultimately, it is critical that Iowans are talking to their friends and family uh, and, and neighbors about these attacks that are being launched um, against uh, against reproductive rights in Iowa, including abortion, because if we don't if we don't talk about it and we don't stand up to the people who are elected to represent us and, and make that uh, majority opinion known, um, then we know that that will have lasting impacts um, for generations to come and certainly will not be easily undone. So I would um, just absolutely encourage folks to be having these conversations. And it's really um, not as scary as it may sound. Uh, and anyone who's interested in learning more about getting comfortable talking about abortion with um, folks that you may know, I'm. Uh, we are always happy to be a resource on that and, and help you in those conversations. Yeah, thank you, Maisie. And I know that, um, probably Pete, maybe they do this in Nebraska as well. I know Plan, uh, Planned Parenthood and um, ACLU in, uh, in Nebraska have basically talking points on their websites to talk to people about uh, these rights. So with this, I'd like to thank our panelists. We are turning it over to questions from the audience. I hope you've been populating the chat. Amy Campbell has been moderating that. So I am now turning this over to Amy for our final questions from the audience to our panelists. Well, we don't have very many of them, but I'm going to give people a chance to go ahead and Think, think through that, get, get it into the chat if you want to. If you are on phone or having trouble with the chat, just um, raise your hand and I will see about un, unmuting you. But I, I guess I did have one comment that was made earlier in the chat about the, the terminology we're using now and um, how that's important. And I don't know if any, um, particularly the lobbyists on here, because I know you, you guys um, are are talking about things with a different language than some of us may have been used to in the past um, and how important that is. Um, I'll just turn the LS, Pete and Maisie those, that question. Can you be more specific? I'm sorry to do that to you, but. but... Yeah, I'm looking for the, <laughs> for it on here. Um, the, specifically, they said, can anyone address the importance of how we have studied, how we talk about abortion using the terms freedom to decide when or if we start a family. Studies show this has more has an effective way of reaching a okay. wider, wider audience. Yeah, got it, got it, got it. This is so, if, you, if you'll forgive me, I'll only talk for a second. I don't want to, to hijack the question, but this is exactly right. And, you know, the way we operate, we hope to operate is meet people where they are. I mean, I don't, I don't care. At, at, at the forum that a lot of us were at a couple of months ago, someone had said, it doesn't matter where you were at, it matter, how you got there, it matters that you get there. And, and in terms of, of language, in terms of, you know, how you describe the issue, from our perspective, you know, there's a, there's a ton of different people with a ton of different lives and experiences, and we go where they are. So, you know, for example, uh, you may be talking with somebody who lived through Roe or who remembers having to go out of state in order to, to uh, you know, I have family members who drove people into Wisconsin, right? You may also be talking to somebody who's 20 years old who never knew a life prior to Dobbs. And so with respect to language, you know, I'm, I can get into details about what studies show, what's persuasive and whatnot, but I don't, I don't know that that's the most useful thing here. My point is meet people where they are because the, the, the recurring thing over, whether it's polling, whether it's, 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 moral behavior versus voting behavior, you know, most people are where we're at. And, and at the same time, most people in Iowa tend to vote for people who aren't, and that is a contradiction. And the only way you get there is by, uh, you communicate by listening instead of talking. Meet them where they are. I, I think that's exactly right. I would, I will add that 
um, you know, leading with leading with values, finding shared values is a really great place to start, a really good way to bridge the conversation. And um, there was a question earlier in the chat about whether it's worth it to reach out to legislators on, on an issue. I think in this case, it was about um, that increased funding for anti-abortion centers, but what fill in the blank, whatever it is, I do think it's always worth that conversation. Um, hear, legislators hearing from their constituents are all, always going to carry 10 times the weight of any lobbyist. So <laughs> I think I can pretty, pretty confidently say that, that legislators always want to hear from their constituents and your voice goes a very long way. Even if you think that your legislator is, is already, you know, you feel like you know their position on something, they keep track of how much how much correspondence they're getting from constituents. So um, I think that's that's really important to just get comfortable in the process of talking of of talking to legislators and keeping up to date on what's you know what's going on. But certainly um, just practice practice makes um, progress, you know, not perfect, but progress. And so uh, being able to uh, just have those conversations yourself with your legislators uh, makes a really big difference. Um, I have a hand raised and before I go to Barbara there, I will get to you next, Barbara. I did want to make a comment that the, um, we had somebody write in the chat um, a personal story about their daughter who um, almost died after giving birth due to an unexpected complication that the doctor had only seen once in her long career. Um, and she asked why why is it that the medical risks of pregnancy seem to be ignored by so many legislators and governors in Iowa and other states? I believe becoming pregnant is a life or death decision for some women. And I think I know Maisie and others, all of you have heard these personal stories throughout the, well, or, or Dr. Amy has had and um, Dr. T have had personal experience as physicians in those positions. But um, I, I do want to make a note that there were two legislators, one in particular whose daughter was in that situation and he vowed never to ever support a Republican legislator to support an abortion ban, unfortunately lost because he also opposed, opposed the school choice bill. <laughs> but um, I think that when you're talking about talking to your legislators, I don't know that enough of them have had or know they've had that personal connection to it. And when you do, it makes a big difference in their decision making. Um, I'm going to go to Barbara. Uh, Hi. There you go. Yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, this program is fantastic. I hope every county league uh, redoes it for uh, everybody to hear all of this. I've been working on abortion since pre row, uh, and I feel like I've learned a bunch on, on this call. Uh, I was the one that lifted up the language issue, and just to put a smaller, finer point on it, uh, as I think it was Maisie said, lead with values. One of the things we in America value is freedom. We are the freedom people. So using uh, uh, Americans deserve the freedom to make the decision of when and if to start a family. So using that freedom word. Secondly, uh, using the word decision instead of choice. It's a small little flip there. Uh, but choice is, I mean, you choose between chocolate and vanilla ice cream. Um, decision is a more weighty word. And everybody who gets an abortion is not a big deal. But honoring those that like this, this is something serious. We have to counter the, the narrative out there that all these women are too stupid or bad to be able to make this decision. Uh, so some folks have studied this, did all kinds of focus groups, all kinds of testing, freedom to make the decision when and if to start a family. So thanks and everybody keep up the great work. Do we have any other questions? I just noted in the chat that we are videotaping this. And so the link to that video along with slides, we will make sure individuals, everybody has that. Uh, that, And I think Therese will probably post that somewhere on our website. So if people want to see it. 
or missed it. Um, we do have another question. Um, isn't the governor and the legislature practicing medicine without a license? They aren't medical experts and refuse to listen to those who are. I don't know, that's probably rhetorical. Well, I would say that I would never put a black robe on and try to be a judge. I think the point is is nicely put more politically than legally. Uh, so, but it's a good point. Well, I guess I'll, one of the questions I didn't get to because I wanted to turn over to the audience, the last question was going to be kind of a lightning round and we could go to that just uh, from each panelist, what would you share about what people in the audience can do? What can they do to take action? And let's start with uh, Dr. Amy. So I think everyone here is here for the right reason. I do think that this fight is exhausting. Um, I think it's really easy to get demoralized and feel beat up when we're not seeing the changes that we're fighting for. So I would just encourage people to keep talking about it, try to get the people who are so discouraged that they're not talking to their legislators, they're not voting, to get those people involved again, just to see the importance of, of the numbers and, and getting everybody's voices heard. So uh, everybody weigh in from the panel. So uh, so Pete, what would you say? Tell your legislator that anything that they do that does not contain exceptions is, is off limits. That regardless of where they're at on the issue of choice, that the legislature needs to be responsive to the, the remarkable majority of Iowans who insist on exceptions to whatever they do. And that sounds a little nuanced because it is, and it's because legislators are missing the boat and they are they are going a direction where Iowans are not and, and uh, paint them into a corner. Professor Frank? Uh, I think it's kind of what we've been talking about. Talk to your family, talk to your friends, talk to your legislators. And um, one rhetorical thing I, I asked your, years ago but if they're doing no exceptions, then what they're saying is they would rather have dead women and dead fetuses than just dead fetuses. And you might want to ask them why they want dead women that could be saved. Dr. Turner. There you go. All right. Thank you. First of all, thanks everybody. This has been awesome. I've loved hearing everybody's thoughts and uh, one quick thing, there are some really great talking points and discussion of this on the league website under league management. And the league has been a supporter of this for since, uh, I think it went into our impact on issues back in the seventies, maybe even before that. So just so you know, that's where we really stand. But I would say what you can do, one, look, tell a story. If you think about it, the way we have learned things and the and the way humans have developed over the uh, centuries and centuries is through storytelling. And so tonight, as you heard people telling stories, those are the things you remember and those are the things that impact you. So find a story that helps you understand about this issue and use that story when you're talking to people. So tell stories. Number two, um, find a friend and make it the buddy system. You know, when we say, when you go to vote, uh, you know, uh, go to vote and take a friend, okay? So when you are engaging in these discussions or going to a meeting or having an educational system like this, bring a friend and share that because you also, we respond much better and understand better and relate better when we hear it from our friends, okay? And the final thing was teach your children. This is an educational process, and it's all about our children and the future that our children are going to have. I like to say everything we do today is about the children that are here who are going to be our future. So figure out ways to teach your children so that when they get to our ages, they will have been exposed to these things and they will have the knowledge 
and the ability to deal with all of these issues in a very productive, democratic, and very diverse and inclusive way. So teach your children, take a friend and tell a story. All very good. Does anybody else have anything to add from the audience on ideas on how you can take action? Uh, and, and by the way, I think it was Barbara that shared, I was recently at a, a conference and there was a study there about using the word freedom and decision <laughs> rather than choice, because it was like, you know, everybody has a choice as Barbara said. So I think the way we talk about things and, and Pete also mentioned this too, and, and kind of trying to do um, some reflection on how we use words and talking to uh, state legislators, for example. Um, I left one thing out, so I can also add, consider becoming a single issue voter. That's what the right has done for a generation. And if we want to turn this around, that might be what we have to do. And um, I will add that Maisie added a couple links in the chat, um, including one where you can sign up a pledge and get um, Planned Parenthood advocates um, emails and action alerts directly. Um, so I encourage everybody to do that as well. I think that's all we have, though. I, we've given everybody a couple shots, uh, Therese and Diane and everyone. Yes, I agree. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation this has been. Oh, my goodness. It's just been so worthwhile. And yes, we will have a recording. We'll have a link that we can share with those who, can't, who have not been able to be here this evening. But I do want to thank Diane, our moderator, for being doing such a wonderful job and asking questions and keeping this moving. And thank you to our panelists, uh, Professor Frank, Pete, Maisie, Dr. T, Dr. Amy. And uh, just it was just wonderful to hear what you had to say for all of us. And also thank you to Amy Campbell, our lobbyist, for setting this up, being our Zoom um, host for this evening. And thanks to all of you who attended. And as you have heard, you know, we've had a challenge here to talk to your legislators, your friends, and, and you know, don't, you know, just don't think, okay, now, now I'm done. I, I've heard all, all I can do. Now it's time to act. And so that we have uh, reproduction rights for all. So anyway, thanks again to everybody and uh, take care and uh, do what you need to do. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you.